Cox is an internet service provider, and they have previously been found to not be processing DMCA takedown notices properly. What's basically being alleged here is that because they didn't process them properly, they are now liable for the underlying copyright infringement. This is Sony Entertainment, Sony, and Universal versus Cox Communication. I mean, it's everybody. It's like all of their subsidiaries. Plaintiffs allege, as set forth below, Cox is one of the largest internet service providers in the country. Cox's contribution to its subscribers' infringement is both willful and extensive and renders Cox equally liable. For years, Cox deliberately refused to take measures to curb its customers from using its internet services to infringe on others' copyrights, even once Cox became aware of particular customers engaging in specific and repeated acts of infringement. Plaintiffs' representatives, as well as others, sent hundreds of thousands of statutory infringement notices to Cox, under penalty of perjury, advising Cox of its subscribers' blatant and systematic use of Cox's internet service to illegally download, copy, and distribute copyrighted music through BitTorrent and other online file-sharing services. Rather than working with plaintiffs to curb this massive infringement, Cox unilaterally imposed an arbitrary cap on the number of infringement notices it would accept from copyright holders, thereby willfully blinding itself to any of its subscribers' infringements that exceeded its cap. Cox also claimed to have implemented a 13-strike policy before terminating service of repeat infringers, but in actuality, Cox never permanently terminated any subscribers. Instead, it lobbed soft terminations with virtually automatic reinstatement, or it simply did nothing at all, prioritizing its own profits over its legal obligations. Congress created a safe harbor in the DMCA that limits the liability of ISPs for copyright infringement when their involvement is limited to, among other things, transmitting, routing, or providing connections for material through a system or network controlled or operated by or for the service provider. To benefit from the DMCA safe harbor, however, along with meeting other preconditions, an ISP must demonstrate that it has adopted and reasonably implemented a policy that provides for the termination, in appropriate circumstances, of subscribers who are repeat infringers. Cox's 13-strike policy has already been revealed to be a sham, and its ineligibility for the DMCA safe harbor for a period of at least February 2012 through November 2014 has been fully and finally adjudicated by this court and affirmed by the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Specifically, the court concluded Cox did not implement its repeat infringer policy. Instead, Cox publicly purported to comply with its policy while privately disparaging and intentionally circumventing the DMCA's requirements. Cox employees followed an unwritten policy put in place by senior members of Cox's abuse group by which accounts used to repeatedly infringe copyrights would be nominally terminated, only to be reactivated upon request. Once these accounts were reactivated, customers were given clean slates meaning the next notice of infringement Cox received linked to those accounts would be considered the first in Cox's graduated response procedure. The court further found that starting in September 2012, Cox abandoned its tacit policy of temporarily suspending and reactivating repeat infringer's accounts and instead stopped terminating accounts altogether. The Fourth Circuit affirmed this court's holding explaining that although Cox formally adopted a repeat infringer policy both before and after September 2012, Cox made every effort to avoid reasonably implementing that policy. Indeed, in carrying out its 13-strike process, Cox very clearly determined not to terminate subscribers who, in fact, repeatedly violated this policy. The former head of Cox's abuse group, Jason Zabeck, summed up Cox's sentiment toward its DMCA obligations best in an email exclaiming, F the DMCA. I'm sure he meant F for respects. Unsurprisingly, <laughs> 
The Fourth Circuit affirmed this court's ruling, holding that Cox failed to qualify for the DMCA safe harbor because it failed to implement its policy in any consistent or meaningful way, leaving it essentially with no policy. The BMG Rice decision that Cox is ineligible for the DMCA safe harbor from at least February 2012 through November 2014 controls here. It is well-established law that a party may not assist someone it knows is engaging in copyright infringement. Further, when a party has a direct financial interest in the infringing activity and the right and practical ability to stop or limit it, that party must act. Ignoring those basic responsibilities, Cox deliberately turned a blind eye to its subscribers' infringement. Cox failed to terminate or otherwise take meaningful action against the accounts of repeat infringers whose identities were known. It also blocked infringement notices for countless others. Despite its professed commitment to take action against repeat offenders, Cox routinely thumbed its nose at plaintiffs by continuing to provide service to individuals it knew to be serially infringing copyrighted works and refusing to even receive notice of any infringements above an arbitrary cap. In reality, Cox operated its service as an attractive tool and a safe haven for infringement. Cox has derived an obvious and direct financial benefit. The infringing activity of Cox's subscribers that is subject to plaintiff's claims and for which Cox is secondarily liable occurred after Cox received multiple notices of a subscriber's infringing activity. Specifically, plaintiffs seek relief for claims of infringement that accrued from February 2013 through November 2014 with respect to works infringed by Cox subscribers after those particular subscribers were identified to Cox in multiple infringement notices. So if, if you're not following this, Cox is an internet service provider and they have previously been found to not be processing DMCA takedown notices properly. Uh, we'll get into the details here in a second, but what's basically being alleged here is that because they didn't process them properly, they are now liable for the underlying copyright infringement, at least in part. Cox has consistently and actively engaged in network management practices to suit its own purposes. This includes monitoring for and taking action against spam and other unwanted activity. But Cox has gone out of its way not to take action against subscribers engaged in repeated copyright infringement at the expense of copyright owners, ultimately forcing plaintiffs to bring this litigation. Plaintiffs repeatedly notified Cox that many of its subscribers were actively utilizing its service in order to infringe. Those notices gave Cox the specific identities of its subscribers, referred to by their unique IP addresses, yet Cox persistently turned a blind eye toward the massive infringement of plaintiffs' works. Cox recognized that if it prevented its repeat infringer subscribers from using its service or made it less attractive for such use, Cox would enroll fewer new subscribers, lose existing subscribers, and lose revenue. Over the past two decades, internet piracy over so-called peer-to-peer networks has become rampant and music owners and other copyright owners have employed litigation and other means to attempt to curtail the massive theft of copyrighted works. Cox has been keenly aware of those efforts. Cox has also been acutely aware of the use of its network for peer-to-peer -peer activity, including the specific identities of subscribers who are using its network to infringe. I can give you a little bit of inside information here. This really is going on. Um, yours truly has been involved in defending people who are accused of piracy for the past seven years. I guess this could be considered attorney advertising, I have to say that. The ISPs know that there is massive infringement because it is a massive amount of their traffic. It's less than it used to be, percentage-wise. Before Netflix, before Amazon Prime Video, and before Google Play Movies and stuff, and before many TV shows were available on demand online, if, 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 you're, if you're very young, you will definitely not remember a time where TV shows were not available online. But as late as 2008 or even more, you couldn't buy certain TV shows online. You could only pirate them. Which is pretty dumb, if you ask me. That was just leaving money on the table. These media companies were so afraid of what was coming... I don't know, it's 10 years later. What what came? I did what what happened? What was so bad? 
but Netflix they, streaming, Hulu. Oh, you mean diversification? Oh, okay. Well, that was terrible. Like there's competition yeah. in the market. Oh my god. The competition was there because they weren't taking advantage like they could have taken advantage of that competition themselves by producing more stuff, by greenlighting more stuff. I mean, look at how much how successful Netflix is just by greenlighting more directors. So all they had to do, the people who were who the, the companies that were afraid of their media going online, all they had to do was greenlight more stuff properly. Worked for Netflix, works for Amazon. Neither of which are major media comp were major media companies at the time. You just left money on the table. So uh, piracy was the only way to get things. Yours truly used to pirate Mythbusters of all things because Discovery refused to put Mythbusters online available for sale. Just not even available. Like you could not pay a price to get it online. So if I wanted it, you had to pirate it. Or you had to pay $120 a month for cable TV. Not paying $120 a month for Mythbusters. Sorry. So I didn't feel bad about pirating it. And when they finally did make it available online, I think I've bought every single episode for $2. So I've, I have made my reparations. Also, that was way more than three years ago, so they can't sue me for it. So I'm not, and I've definitely not pirated anything recently. Um, and even if I did, I wouldn't admit to it, but I haven't had to. Like, I can afford to pay for my stuff now, so I do. There's no need to to take the chance of, oh, you're going to get a, a lawsuit against you, or you're going to get a takedown notice from your ISP or something, if I, if, if I can afford it. If you can't afford it, I can't endorse you doing it, but I can understand it. I certainly, uh, you know, Chris Rock, I don't condone it, but I understand. The record company plaintiffs began sending notices to Cox and other ISPs identifying specific instances of subscriber infringement through peer-to-peer -peer activities. From early 2013 through March 2015, Cox received more than 200,000 notices, each provided under penalty of perjury, detailing specific instances of subscribers using its network to infringe copyrighted music. But those hundreds of thousands of notices represented only a fraction of the actual infringements that occurred. For years, Cox has arbitrarily capped the number of infringement notices it is willing to receive, even refusing to hear any complaints in excess of the cap. Starting in 2008, Cox refused to accept any more than 200 infringement notices per day from plaintiff's representatives. In early 2009, Cox agreed to increase that number to 400 per day. In July 2009, the record company plaintiffs asked Cox to increase the limit to 800 or 1,000 notices per day, but Cox denied the request on the grounds that it was currently at the maximum number of notices that it could process, measured against the staff they have to process calls. In 2013, plaintiffs' representatives again asked Cox to increase the limit, this time to 600 per day. Cox agreed. While Cox finally received 200,000 notices from 2013 to 2015, the actual number of infringements identified through Cox's network in those early years was vastly more. In other words, Cox willfully blinded itself to scores of infringements by refusing to accept notices beyond this arbitrary cap. Cox alone had the ability to match IP addresses in an infringement notice with a particular subscriber. Only Cox had the information required to match the IP address to a particular subscriber and to contact that subscriber or terminate that subscriber's service. Apart from attesting to the sheer volume of the infringing activity on its network, the infringement notices sent to Cox pointed to specific subscribers who were flagrant and serial infringers. Almost 20,000 Cox subscribers engaged in repeated infringement to cite specific examples a 601-day period had 142 infringement notices on one account. A 539-day period had 104 infringement notices on one account. A 426-day period had 96 infringement notices. A 326-day period had 84. And a 248-day period had 64 infringement notices, each on separate accounts. These examples and countless others amply illustrate that rather than terminating repeat infringers and losing subscription revenues, Cox simply looked the other way. During all pertinent times, Cox has had the full legal right, obligation, and technical ability to prevent or limit the infringements occurring. 
Although Cox purported to create a repeat infringer policy, this court has already found that it never implemented it and is thus ineligible for the DMCA's safe harbor. In denying Cox's motion for judgment as a matter of law after its trial, this court explained, The graduated response system is essentially a 13-strike policy. No action is taken on receipt of a subscriber's first notice. The second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh notices generate an email to the subscriber warning that if Cox continues to receive infringement claims such as this, we will suspend your account and disable your connection. Eighth and ninth notices Cox limits a subscriber's internet access to a single web page containing a warning. The customer then can self-reactivate by clicking on an acknowledgement. On the 10th and 11th notices, Cox suspends service and requires a support call to a technician. The technician explains the reason for suspension, advises removal of the allegedly infringing file, and then reactivates service. On the 12th notice, the subscriber is suspended and directed to special technicians. On the 13th notice, the subscriber is again suspended and this time considered for termination. Regardless of whether a 13-strike policy could ever be reasonable, this court previously found that Cox did not implement that policy. Any notice Cox did receive beyond its self-imposed limit was not counted in the graduated response. Cox only counted one notice per day per subscriber. Thus, if a subscriber generated 10 or 15 or 100 notices in a day, they were rolled up into a single ticket. Cox also restarted the 13 strike policy every six months, so an infringing subscriber with 12 notices would get a free pass back to zero if six months had passed since her first notice. When Cox did soft terminate subscribers for repeat infringements, it enforced an unwritten policy of reactivating subscribers shortly thereafter, and with few exceptions, starting in September 2012, Cox simply stopped terminating repeat infringers altogether. I can't defend it. Like this is this is indefensible. Um, this is stuff that we've seen before in the Fourth Circuit uh, uh, case that we we went over a few months ago. This this is this is Cox can't do this. They have they 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 should have been more attentive to their requirements under the DMCA safe harbor. And the worst part is that it's currently actually indefensible because it's already been found to be true right right it's the the judge has already found most of this to be true and what we're talking about here now is whether its contribution to the copyright infringement carries monetary penalties and i mean is there any doubt that it does it, it i'm not i'm not i can't tell you what the judge is going to find but yeah there's definitely going to be damages found against Cox. Cox knowingly permitted identified repeat infringer subscribers to continue to use Cox's network to infringe, knowingly continued to provide these subscribers with internet access that enabled them to continue to use BitTorrent and other peer-to-peer -peer networks illegally. Cox's provision of high-speed internet service materially contributed to these direct infringements. Their motivation was simple, it valued corporate profits over its legal responsibilities. Cox did not want to lose subscriber revenue by terminating accounts. Jason Zabeck, the former head of Cox's abuse group, made this clear by urging a Cox customer service representative in an internal email that he instructed should not be forwarded to start the warning cycle over for terminated customers with Cox.net email addresses. A clean slate, if you will. This way, we can collect a few extra weeks of payments for their account. Smiley face. Oh, winky face. Oh. Cox was simply disinterested in devoting sufficient resources to tracking infringers, responding to infringement notices, and terminating accounts in appropriate circumstances. Cox ignored and turned a blind eye to flagrant repeat violations by known specific subscribers. Their failure to adequately police infringing subscribers was a draw to subscribers to, prove, to purchase Cox's services. So they allege that the foregoing activity constitutes direct infringement in violation of 17 U.S.C. Uh, 106, which is the list of copyrights. Literally, the right to distribute, the right to copy, the right to, de to re make derivative works, etc. Cox is liable as a contributory infringer for direct infringements above. 
Cox had knowledge that its network was being used for copyright infringement and also knew of specific subscribers engaged in repeated and flagrant infringement. By purposefully ignoring and turning a blind eye, Cox knowingly caused and materially contributed to the unlawful reproduction and distribution of plaintiff's copyrighted work. Each infringement of plaintiff's copyrighted sound recordings and musical co compositions constitutes a distinct and separate act of infringement. The foregoing acts are willful. That's very important because a judge will usually triple the damages, which of course in law we have to use the word treble. He will treble the damages, triple the damages in order to uh, account for the willful misconduct. As a direct and proximate result of Cox's willful infringement, plaintiffs are entitled to statutory damages. If you're unfamiliar with how this works, damages are normally actual damages. If I run into your car, I have to pay for the fixing of your car, but nothing more. You don't get extra money for your pain and suffering unless there was pain and suffering. You don't get extra money to punish me unless I did something worthy of punishing. So there is, for, for a simple business accident, you would simply get whatever the damage is, make the party whole make as much of a, a, a appropriate remedy as possible. You can take an entire class called Remedies in law school, and they go over all the different ways you can make someone whole. But, but basically, we're talking about compensation only. Well, copyright can sometimes be hard to prove. If I make, if I make millions of copies of a CD, and I distribute them around the country to bootleggers who will sell them on the streets, how much damage have I done? Can we even figure out how many copies have been sold? Maybe we know I made a million, but can we even know how many are really out there being used and how many got thrown away? How can we measure the actual damage? You can't. You cannot. So we have something in law called statutory damages where a judge can choose within their discretion a range of damages anywhere from about $750 on the low end to about $150,000 on the high end for willful infringement. Uh, if if the judge finds that that there is copyright infringement and that the plaintiff has registered their copyright in a timely fashion. If both things are true, then you can get access to statutory damages. This is what enables copyright trolls. Copyright trolls aren't interested in proving actual damages. They go straight after statutory minimum copyright damages, $750 per title. So if you have a couple titles against you, that's a couple thousand dollars, and they're interested now. If they can prove that your copyright infringement was willful, then that's a tripling of the damages. Now the 750 minimum is 2250 minimum for one act of copyright infringement. Now attorneys are interested. Now attorneys will get out of bed for $2,250 plus costs or minus you know, expenses or whatever. They will get out of bed if they think they're going to get paid a couple thousand dollars to prove a single act of copyright infringement. So that's what's going on with statutory damages. Alternatively, at plaintiff's election, pursuant to 17 U.S.C. 504b, plaintiffs shall be entitled to actual damages, including Cox's profits from the infringements. Normally, actual damages does include a disgorging of profits. So these cases where a large media organization like another record company has accidentally infringed sometimes they simply take the profits they whatever their accounting department says were the profits they take that money plaintiffs are also entitled to their attorney's fees and costs pursuant to 17 usc 505 cox is liable as a vicarious copyright infringer as well they had the legal and practical right and ability to supervise and control the infringing activities that occur through the use of their network and at all relevant times had a financial interest in and derived financial benefit from the infringing use of its network. They derived an obvious and direct financial benefit by failing to terminate the accounts of specific repeat infringers. They profited from the illicit revenue that would not have been otherwise received. The prayer for relief asks for statutory damages, costs, and attorney's fees. They haven't really asked for an amount of money, but when you're alleging 
thousands of violations at $150,000 a violation, it's a multi-million dollar, probably a billion dollar lawsuit. I have absolutely no idea how Cox will survive this. Does anyone know how large Cox is? They had revenue of $10.4 billion in 2014, so they can probably afford to pay a few hundred million. That's my guess. Let me. I'm going to put my put my dollar on the table. I think that Cox will get hit with a couple hundred million dollars in damages, maybe two hundred. Yeah, that sounds about right. Two hundred million dollars. <laughs> All right, everybody, remember that. So that's our show, everyone. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And uh, I did spend two hours this morning in Fusion 9, making a little waffle masses fly in. I, I, I know it's not that good. I have to, I have to work on it a little bit, but uh, it's in 3D and, and, and it's working. So real quick, let me thank our supporters for the month of August. Thank you very much to everyone who is supporting our channel in August. This is, of course, a community-supported channel. You can support on patreon.com slash ljfrench. Special thanks to the $50 plus supporters, Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, John H. Anderson, Vera Mantain, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Grunkle Tia Marie, and Michael Jones. Thank you very much for your support at the $50 level. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters, the... LED panel is updating, and I don't know if it's coming through, but it is not flickering, right? Like, I have fixed the flicker, and all I've done is reduce the refresh rate to the 30 frames per second for the camera. On my end, it is flickering like mad. I can see all 30 frames, but on your end, it comes through fine. Okay. All right, everyone. I'll, I'll stop joking around. Have a good week. I'll see you in the in the vods that drop. I might do the uh, the Trump emoluments one from last week first because I wanted to drop that one. And I think we have a special thing from Bob Murray that we have to get out this week. Love you all. Have a good weekend. Or weekend? Yeah, good weekend and a good week. It is. It's still the weekend, so have a good weekend. I wasn't wrong, but I I, I meant to say have a good week. Not can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. Fox ignored and turned a blind eye to fragrant, fr frag fragrant, <laughs> fragrant <laughs> violations. Oof. Those are some pretty smelly yogurt. violations. Yeah. <laughs>